The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The proceeding. Order, order. Elliot Colburn to move the motion. Thank you, Caroline, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And on behalf of the Petitions Committee, I would like to introduce two petitions to the House today, dealing with legislation on animal testing and the promotion of non-animal research methods. And I would just like to stress, Dan Caroline, that we are here once again. This is becoming an annual debate now, which I think demonstrates the strength of feeling of our constituents and of people across the UK as a nation of animal lovers, that these uh, procedures and processes really must start being brought to an end. Um, and if I could just start by reading out the prayers of these petitions. The first petition, number 624876, advocates for an ending to animal toxicity tests and prioritising non-animal methods, or NAMs as I will refer to them throughout the course of this debate. This petition was started by Maria uh, and closed in September 2023 with 109,378 signatures, including 233 from my own Carshalton and Wallington constituency. And it argues that NAMs are more predictive of human biology, economically advantageous and prevent animal suffering. Now, in regards to the second petition, number 643611, this calls for the banning of the use of dogs for testing for research, citing their cognitive abilities and their emotional range. Uh, this petition was started by singer, songwriter and actor Will Young, who I'm delighted to see in the public gallery today, uh, and as of now has over 30,000 consignatures, including 35 from my own Carshalton and Wallington constituency. Now, I'd just like to begin with a bit of background information, if I may, Dame Caroline. Animal testing is currently covered under the Animal Specific Scientific Procedures Act 1986, which was amended in 2012 to um, include cephalods um, as protected animals. Regulated procedures include acts that may cause pain, suffering, distress, or lasting harm to animals. And animal testing is often cited by some in the industry as being necessary for various purposes, including for drug development, veterinary medicines and chemical or environmental safety testing. However, we have already made movements, for example, in the ban on testing for beauty products and cosmetics in 1998. And a recent written question answer from the government has confirmed that there are no laws mandating the use of animal testing. However, we are still in a very challenging situation where these practices are still being um, upheld. And I just want to reiterate some of the data that we spoke about last year. Uh, in 2021, over 3 million scientific procedures were conducted on animals. And if that number wasn't already bad enough, that was actually an increase on the previous years. That was an increase in the use of dogs by 3%, of cats by 6%, of horses by 29%, and monkeys by 17%. Now, we can only speculate as to why uh, this number increased during that year, but it certainly doesn't tie in with the messages that we're hearing that the use of NAMS is supposed to be on the up and the use of animals is supposed to be on the down. 
But in addition to that, it isn't just the fact that these procedures are happening to animals altogether. It's also the awful conditions that the animals are often kept in whilst awaiting procedures to be done onto them. And a recent report from Animals and Science Regulation Unit described deeply troubling animal welfare um, standards in British laboratories between uh, 2019 and 2021. And I'm sure many of us in our post boxes would have received emails from people who have sent us pictures and videos of some of these. And before this debate, I've seen some pretty awful things happening here in the UK that are happening to animals. And that is despite industry telling us that they uphold the highest possible animal welfare standards. And these failings include a non-human primate dying after becoming trapped behind a restraint device, 112 rats being crushed alive when they were moved in error to a compactor, and numerous incidents of animals being left without water or food. Now, as I said in my opening, the UK does purport to be a nation of animal lovers, and I truly believe that. But we need to make sure that we are updating our laws to truly reflect that fact. Now, I will acknowledge that there are efforts being made to promote non-animal uh, non methods or NAMs, including cell cultures, human tissues, computer modelling and volunteer studies, and the organisations um, who are trying to invest and improve the use of non-animal non -animal methods to reduce reliance on animal testing. However, I do just want to uh, pay uh, particular scrutiny here. This is in relation to the, uh, the second of the two petitions that we are debating today, um, which particularly draws into the issue of dogs. Now, dogs are most commonly used in what we call secondary species testing, where a test on an animal, normally a mouse or a rat, may have already been conducted. Um, but some then go on in uh, their research to conduct a secondary test on a different species, and a dog is very commonly cited as an animal to use in that period, uh, um, in that experiment. However, the industry themselves are saying that this is almost completely unnecessary now. Uh, Organisations such as Pfizer and AstraZeneca have stood up at global health forums and said, we don't want to do secondary species testing anymore. Please help us find the roadmap to get us out of the need to do this. So um, I will ha gladly give way. Thank you. Uh, may, I, may I thank my friend for allowing me to intervene? And, and his speech is very... Uh, passionate on such a, an important matter. Now, in my constituent for Honest Morn, we are an island of animal lovers, from dolphins and red squirrels to sheep and cattle and our feline and canine friends. And so it's no surprise that many of my constituents actively campaign for the rights of animals and are supportive of reducing the use of animals in scientific experiments. So uh, my question is, they and I would like to know what steps the government is taking to support the pharmaceutical industry in the development and use of non-animal testing models. Nick I'm Colvin. grateful to my honourable friend for that intervention, and I think over 100 of her constituents signed this petition as well. Um, and absolutely, and I hope that the Minister, through her intervention, has heard that request, and indeed I'm sure that's the ask of all, all of us here in this chamber today, is to ask what more can be done and is being done uh, to try and encourage people out of the use of animals and into non-animal methods. And I just want to pick up again on this point about animal welfare, because... Many people will cite the, the regulations that are uh, in place in the UK for animals in experiment, in, in experiment uh, environments. Um, however, this might breathe some light as to why these welfare standards are so low. Um, as of 2021, there was just an estimated 23 full-time equivalent inspectors in the United Kingdom. Um, and that's 30, 23 inspectors trying to look at 3 million different um, procedures taking place. So with so much self-reporting going on within the industry uh, and, with only, and with so few inspectors, again, it leads to this argument that non-animal methods are a much better use of money as well as the ethical and moral standards that come with it. And I want to just go through over some of the proposed solutions before I pass on to some of my colleagues. Now, Peter proposed a solution um, um, which is known as the Research Modernisation Deal, or the RMD, which offers a strategy to eliminate the use of animals in biomedical research, regulatory testing, and education. It prioritises non-animal methods, it conducts critical reviews to assess the necessity of animal use, and reallocates funds to non-animal methods. And this is aimed specifically to put the UK as, once again, a leader in innovative, ethical, scientific practices. 
Furthermore, we've seen advances in technology, such as in vitro and in silico tests, innovative technologies like organon chips, which offer higher levels of protection and prediction accuracy. And this is one of the things I want to stress. But before I do, I will give way to the chair of the select committee. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. And he makes a really important point there that actually non-animal methods can be much more accurate than using animals in these experiments. And I would just like to ask whether he agrees with me that companies like Lush, who came to Parliament before Christmas advocating these methods, have actually shown the way through science that we can do better. My right honourable friend, and that is something that I think we cannot stress enough throughout the course of this debate. It has been proven time and time again in the data that non-animal methods are highly, are much more highly accurate when it comes to predicting human responses than animal testing does. In fact, animal testing has such low levels of success when it comes to measuring how a drug or something else might affect a human that we wouldn't accept that in any other form of business. I don't think those those levels of prediction are so poor that why are we still accepting this? It doesn't make any sense. Not when we have alternatives which can offer much greater clarity um, in terms of how humans will react to these products and these drugs. However, there are challenges standing in the way, and one of them remains around funding for NAMS. Now, both Pfizer, again, and AstraZeneca have come out to say that they don't want to do things like secondary species testing, but that regulatory guidelines often expect new drugs to be tested on animals, and there is a lack of consensus on possible transition timelines, pushback from the industry resistant to change. Um, however, I speak, I've, in advance of this debate, I spoke to many, many scientists and industry leads who have said that they are crying out um, for change. They want to be at the forefront of non-animal methods. So we need to give them the tools to do so. And funding, absolutely, the way that we fund research must be looked at. Because I will gladly give way. Standing up for all of those animals who don't have a voice in this industry mm -hmm. um, and those across the UK who want to support them. Um, in terms of uh, organisations who contacted me, they were talking about the need for change and for looking after animals, particularly beagle pups, post-testing mm. wherever possible, but are saying that actually industry has been very, very resistant to engaging with rehoming centres even when the beagle pups have not undergone lethal testing. Surely we can do better and make sure that wherever an animal can have a life in a, a home that's so loving afterwards that we make that happen. Yeah. My honourable friend is absolutely You're right. And again, I hope that the Minister has heard that through, through her intervention. Uh, and indeed, the, I think the sight of the commercial breeding of beagles in particular um, is something that's very hard for us to accept as a country. And again, I think the data shows how completely unnecessary quite a lot of this, if not all of this, is because the accuracy of the tests are so low. Um, but in addition, the very need to do a secondary species test on a dog is now so, um, it seems so unnecessary given uh, the data that it begs the question, why are we still allowing it to happen? Now, since we had this debate last year, there has been some welcome news internationally where countries such as Canada, Australia, and countries within the European Union have now come up with roadmaps to do just this. How are we going to end animal testing? And I think that must be the critical ask of government in this debate. We need a strategy, we need a roadmap to work with industry, yes, but working with campaign groups, with charities and other organisations, the people who are here represented in the public gallery today as well, um, to make sure that we can come up with a viable strategy, a viable roadmap to get us away from the use of animals and move more towards a non-animal method as the default standard. Now, I appreciate that some countries have found it very difficult to come up with precise timelines because of the disagreement that there is within the sector. But that does not mean that we should not try. So I really think that that is the key thing to take away from this debate. But there are things that we can do in the immediate and the interim term um, as well. And one of them must be that look on animal welfare standards. 23, and 23 people looking at 3 million procedures just simply isn't enough. An immediate review of secondary species testing and the necessity of it. And it is imperative that whatever happens next, that we prioritise the development and the adoption of non-animal research methods. The fact that they went up 
in 2021, and we actually stopped collecting data after that point, so we're not actually entirely sure as a nation now um, how many we're doing, uh, which I think that in, in itself is a mistake. Um, but the fact that they increased in that year period, just a few years ago, demonstrates that I really do not think there is enough impetus or progress behind the agenda to move towards non-animal methods. So I would ask the government, by investing and funding NAMS properly, by reallocating existing funds and promoting collaboration, the government has an incredible ability to bring people together. They have the ability to bring together industry, researchers, advocacy groups, campaigners and others to build us forward that roadmap and that strategy so we can truly say that the UK doesn't need to use these anymore. We can stop the use of animals and we can truly hold ourselves up to an incredibly high international standard as the nation of animal lovers that we all know that we are. The question is that the House has considered e-petition 633591 and 645885 relating to animal testing and non-animal research methods. I call We're a Hob House. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it is a pleasure to serve uh, with you in the chair, and I congratulate the Honourable Member for Carl Scholten for leading this debate in such a detailed and um, passionate and, and knowledgeable way. Madam Chair, my Bath constituents are passionate about animals, like probably any constituents um, um, that you in, in this chamber represent. Many have contacted me to oppose the use of animals in laboratory testing. It is upsetting for all those who love animals to learn that in laboratories across the country, so many animals, including dogs, which we often describe as our best friend, are subject to awful experiments under the guise of public good. It is often said that the UK is a nation of animal lovers, and I think that is absolutely true. The UK was the first country to instigate animal protection laws in 1822 and the first country to set up an animal welfare charity the Society of the Prevention of Cruelty. Public opinion is clear. Nearly 100 of my constituents have signed the petition to end the use of animals for toxicity tests and priorities, prioritized non-animal methods, or NAMS, as we have already heard. There is enough evidence now that non-animal methods can be more accurate, cost-effective, and quicker than traditional animal models. While it is already the case that researchers are required to use non-animal methods wherever possible, concerns have been raised that the process of checking if NAMS have been used is not rigorous enough. Cruelty Free International has previously found cases where animal testing has been used, although non-animal alternatives were available. It is therefore disappointing that the government's response to these petitions is that there will be no change in the law. While we should all welcome the fact that we have improved our animal welfare laws over the years, we shouldn't be complacent. At a time when new alternatives and non-animal test methods are being developed, we should embrace this as an opportunity for leadership and to make regulations more stringent. I'm sure that we all want to minimize the use of animals in scientific experimentations and the cosmetic industries as much as possible, including by funding research into alternatives. And we have already heard um, about um, Lush and their very successful um, reception uh, last, at the end of last year. Um, th there, there are enough companies who are really, really promoting this use of alternative methods, and we should really listen to um, industry in this case as well. We know that animal testing can be unreliable and predictable and causes unnecessary suffering. Humans differ considerably from animals, so the use of animals often leads to poor results. The regulatory requirements that animals be used before human trials is over 70 years old. Reviewing this and removing needless sufferings of animals will finally bring scientific research into the 21st century. And there are also, of course, methods of digital testing. And, you know, we really have moved um, a long way um, since um, uh, the uh, law was last um, revised. There's already a growing number of human-relevant methods being developed. They're made up of innovative technologies which are helping to deliver better results for humans. Despite this, there's a continued misconception that animal testing provides a gold standard for regulatory approval of a product. An expert advisory task force could play an important role in exploring animal-free innovation. We should also review, review all animal procedures to remove duplicative and wasteful methods and prevent the retesting on animals 
of any material, chemical, food or drug currently in use. Retesting should only be conduct, con, conducted by non-animal methods or through the use of existing human data. The government has responded to the petition to ban any testing on dogs, saying that welfare standards are already high and that testing would continue in other countries. All of those are very um, uh, uh, valid responses, and yet I think um, we can just simply do better um, and we can provide even more leadership to other countries. Uh, that other countries continue to use dogs is not a very good um, excuse why, why we should do it in this country. While we should be proud that the UK has some of the highest welfare standards in the world, we must build on our robust record and lead by example. To achieve this, greater funding is required to support the development of new technologies and new innovative testing methods. Sadly, government funding for these methods currently represents less than 1% of total UK biomedical research. And we can really do better. And I would particularly like to hear from the government on this point and from the minister. We know that increase in research funding, and we had debate on research funding in, in this chamber before, um, it really very often pays back multiple times to the economy. Um, so investment um, makes such, such good sense. There is no excuse for animal cruelty, and we must do all we can to ensure the humane treatment of animals is upheld everywhere. The moral and scientific case for tighter regulations of lab laboratory testing is clear. It is time that the government listen to increasing numbers of scientists and voters. Thank you. George Eustis. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dame Caroline. And I think this is an incredibly uh, important debate brought about by these two uh, petitions. And that's because in 1986, this country introduced the Animals Bracket Scientific Procedures Act, which at its time was seen as world leading, it was seen as the gold standard with its three R principles, that is to replace animal testing wherever possible, to reduce animal testing where that wasn't uh, possible to replace it, and then to refine it to reduce the suffering uh, where it occurred. However, it's increasingly clear that a review of this legislation is now needed and that we need to make further legislative improvements in this country because we've always been ahead of the United States on issues of animal welfare. But this is one area where arguably we've now fallen behind the United States, in that the US until recently used to require animal testing for certain product authorizations. But they've recently brought forward uh, legislation to modernize their statute, which makes explicitly clear in statute uh, that there is no need for animal testing. Uh, or in any of these uh, projects. Now, in the UK, we have a degree of ambiguity. Uh, it's true, true that the uh, MHRA uh, themselves do not explicitly require uh, animal testing, but there's a degree of ambiguity there, and they're equally cautious about saying there shouldn't be uh, animal testing, and I'll come on to that. Now, I want to say that we should always, in debates like this, give credit where credit is due. And it is important to note that in 2023, the government effectively banned the use of animal testing on the development of cosmetics, or at least made clear there would be no new licenses for such activities. And that followed huge progress made by companies like uh, Unilever and others to phase out uh, the need for animal testing on their products. However, the greatest concern for me is that despite an exponential growth in non-animal methods and huge leaps in that technology over 20 years with the development, for instance, of organ on chip and bioprinting. The numbers of animals used in animal tests remain stubbornly high at around 4 million per year, principally mice. Now, the 1986 Act is deficient in some minor but quite obvious ways. So when it was originally drafted in 1986, it simply covered invertebrates, which was consistent with the animal welfare legislation that we had at the time. In 2012, the coalition government decided to add cephalopods uh, to the legislation as well. And for those not familiar uh, with this terminology, that essentially means um, a species from the octopus family. But they did not add decapods. And of course, as the minister will know, the recent Animal Sentience Act now recognises both cephalopods and decapods uh, as being uh, sentient species. And so at the very least, we should be bringing 
1986 Act into line with our current animal welfare legislation, and that would require uh, the addition of decapods to the legislation as well as protected species. But the more important concern I've got is that if the three R's were to be applied correctly, given the exponential growth in technology that we've seen in 20 years, we would have expected to see a correlation and a sharp reduction in the numbers uh, of, uh, of animals being used as the replacement principle was applied. But instead, over the past 20 years, it's really drifted along sideways. I appreciate it's dipped at times, but it's telling that in the first year of lockdown, when the numbers of animals did uh, fall quite significantly, it was said that it had fallen to the lowest level since 2004. Now, that's quite damning uh, in itself, because if um, an anomaly year where the, um, the amount of testing was at an all-time low, if that means uh, that it still had only got back to the level it was in 2004, that suggests that something is going wrong and that the application of the three R's is not having the effect that was originally intended by the 1986 Act. So I'm afraid it's hard to avoid the conclusion that what started out in 1986 as a robust regime, perhaps the most robust regime in the world, has probably coalesced and drifted into a rather unsatisfactory system of self-regulation. Because we have to ask ourselves, why is it that those three R's and those principles are not being effectively applied? And I think it's ultimately because everybody defers to process, but no one really takes proper ownership. And what we've ended up with are cultural attitudes around the use of animals uh, in, uh, in scientific procedures, masquerading as science, uh, when actually the science doesn't require uh, those animals to be used on the numbers they are at all. And I will give up. Yeah. I've always thought that one of the problems, and maybe as a former DEFRA secretary, um, he'll have insight into this, is the fact that animal welfare sits with DEFRA, um, Home Office is in charge of licensing and usually it's in the hands of a minister that has got 101 other things on their plate and it's a very small part of their brief. And then now we've got the science team here today that hopefully are looking at the more progressive view. Is that the problem, that there's not one minister that can take ownership of this? Well, I think it's part of the problem. And I, I, if the minister, uh, I'm sure he's got a very, very busy uh, diary and um, uh, I know there's this uh, argument that comes partly on the um, science department, partly uh, on the Home Office, and it sits within the Home Office at the moment, and the unit that processes these licenses sit in the Home Office. But as I'll say later, there's a very, very strong case for a machinery of government change that actually relieves the Home Office of this burden uh, that they are not really qualified to uh, carry out, and to transfer it to a department like DEFRA, uh, where you have vets, and uh, where this legislation can be treated uh, rightly, as a piece of animal welfare legislation rather than a piece of um, you know, scientific licensing. Um, now, I want to explain why I think we have this problem, and it's because to get a project license, and there are three types of license you need, and an individual has to have a license to be able to carry out these scientific procedures. There's then a license on the establishment. That's fairly uncontroversial. The difficulty comes really with the project licenses, and that is because universities uh, and research institutions all have their own internal uh, animal welfare and ethics boards that assess applications before they go uh, to the Home Office. But do we know how hard they really challenge uh, those requests that come up uh, from academics working in their institutions? Perhaps they occasionally ask a few questions, challenge a bit, but it appears that they really just uh, effectively defer to the judgment of the academics putting in requests and, um, and the academics then uh, agree, the, um, the ethics board agrees the application and it is then submitted to the Home Office. And then the team in the Home Office, who let's bear in mind have to process around 4,000 of these project uh, licenses a year, they're, they're overworked, they're stretched, they will see that uh, an ethics board with professors and people with a uh, doctor in front of their name and so on have assessed that this is necessary and this is needed. Um, they will then defer to the, uh, the, the scientific knowledge of those boards. Um, and perhaps wrongly so, because while scientists are indeed qualified to give good technical analysis, 
they are not by and large qualified to make good decisions, uh, least of all when it comes to decisions relating to policy and policies uh, underpinned by laws made in this House. Uh, only really the civil service backed up with ministers can make those kinds of, of decisions. So I suspect that what happens is within the Home Office there's a large degree of deference to those animal welfare and ethics boards which is possibly misplaced. And that's why the Home Office almost never refuse a licence. And I get that when parliamentary questions are put down on this, Home Office ministers will say, well, you, you can't really uh, judge the fact that we haven't refused a licence as being evidence that we're not um, applying our, ourselves with veracity to this task because often uh, we will question things and send applications back for further consideration. And I do completely understand that, and it's a, it's a fair point. But are we really saying that when you have over 4,000 project applications a year, there is not at least just one of those where the Home Office might judge uh, it's it, uh, appropriate to refuse the request in order to create some boundaries and some parameters and to inject some vigour uh, and rigour into the system? I think a further uh, cultural problem stems from the MRHA, uh, which regulates um, medicinal products and pharmaceutical products uh, in the UK. Because while, as I said earlier, they have confirmed that they do not require uh, animal testing and that it is open uh, to individual companies and research establishments to decide what type of research uh, they need, there is a perception that exists, I think, within industry and within academia that says... Uh, experiments that have been carried out using live animals have greater credibility and greater acceptability. And I think a clear statement from the MRHA, uh, not only that it is um, uh, neutral or indifferent on this matter, but that actually it will take a dim view uh, of products brought before it, that the used animal experiments uh, when that might not have been necessary, would actually help sharpen the process and focus minds uh, about the need uh, for using uh, animal uh, uh, experiments. So how do we try to get to a position <clears throat> where the three R's are actually applied as the original uh, act intended? Well, one of the motions before us calls for more funding for non-animal uh, methods. And you know, in the UK, we are blessed with some of the best researchers uh, in the world in this area. We have the Blizzard Institute at London at uh, Queen Mary University that I visited uh, a few months ago. Uh, and that hosts the Animal Replacement Centre of Excellence, and they are doing some extraordinary uh, work there on uh, organ-on-chip uh, and bioprinting, and in particular when it comes to uh, dermatological uh, research. It, it's now the case that without any doubt, uh, these non-animal methods are far superior uh, to uh, using live animals. And so one of the uh, proposals I wanted to put before uh, the Minister is a if you like, a probing proposal as a way we could both raise money and sharpen uh, some of the incentives in the current uh, system and get the three R's enforced, would be that we consider applying a levy uh, on the use of, of each individual animal uh, used in animal testing as part of the project license. Now, in some ways, that feels quite incongruous to me, that we have to put a monetary value on the life of a mouse in order to get people to take it seriously, but if the intrinsic... Uh, value of the life of a mouse is something that researchers uh, are not taking as seriously as they should, well then let's consider some other incentives that might reinforce those original um, uh, three R principles. So let's consider, for instance, uh, applying a project uh, license levy of say £100 or £200 for each and every mouse uh, that is used and see if that focuses minds uh, on those animal welfare and ethics committees. Uh, see if it makes them uh, think twice before saying that they need 100 mice for something when maybe they could do it uh, with less. I, I think we should consider something like this. And the other you know, advantage <coughs> of a levy is you could then ring fence uh, all of the proceeds from that and put it directly uh, into research uh, on um, non-animal methods. Um, so I, I put that as a suggestion to the minister. I've been a minister myself for nine years. I, <coughs> I know it's very easy for people to call for more money for things, um, 
But if you're the minister that has to go to the Treasury and say, by the way, we'd just like just a little bit more money for this one thing that's quite important. I know it's not uh, straightforward. And while traditionally, 20 years ago, the Treasury didn't like levies, they saw that as a hypothecated tax, um, we're, we're in different territory post the financial crisis and many other uh, problems that have happened since. And I'm sure that if the minister were to go to the Treasury and say he was going to apply a, a levy of £200 per mouse used in experiments, the, the Treasury's faces would probably light up and they would see the potential to be able to do something uh, useful with this. Um, I think there's a final point I'd like to make, which I touched on earlier, and that is where should responsibility uh, for the 1986 Act and the policy under it uh, reside. And there is some discussion going on within government, I know, uh, on this matter uh, uh, at the moment. Um, my view is that the Home Office is a very busy department. It's got huge uh, amounts to contend with. Um, it, it's very unlikely that ministers would be able to give this particular issue the attention, really, that it deserves. And the right thing to do would be to make a machinery of government change uh, transferring full responsibility uh, for animal testing and the 1986 Act uh, and the regulatory regime under it to DEFRA. Because in DEFRA you have the vets, you have scientists, um, you have people who would approach this issue as an animal welfare issue, uh, but equally you have people uh, who understand the importance uh, of science and, and as our vets uh, prove uh, on multiple occasions when, when need to be they're not necessarily squeamish uh, about these matters and will take uh, difficult decisions uh, when they need to. But I think most important of all, if you had this policy with DEFRA, uh, you would have that situation where veterinary science could challenge medical science. Because often we find that in veterinary science you've got a better understanding of vaccinations and epidemiology and medicines. Um, you've got a body of technical expertise that is able to bring challenge uh, to uh, the, the medical expertise that sits in other departments. And that is why I think this machinery of government change uh, should take place. So I hope the uh, Minister will uh, look favourably on some of these suggestions. Uh, obviously, uh, I appreciate it's very unlikely that he's going to be able to bring forward uh, a levy that might sharpen some of the uh, implementation of the three R's between now and the general election. But of course, all parties... Uh, will be able to think uh, about these issues as they draft their manifestos for the general election ahead. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dame Caroline, for calling me today. It's a pleasure, as always, to serve under your chairmanship. And may I congratulate my friend, the member for Carsholton and Wallington, for his excellent introduction to this debate, setting out all of the issues uh, with his usual informed style and self. So thank you very much for that. Now, animal welfare is an issue that I've spoken on on many occasions during my time in Parliament. It has consistently remained at the forefront of issues that my constituents write to me on, and I'm honoured to represent them in this debate today. I've always maintained that we are a nation of animal lovers, and I believe the nearly 110,000 signatures that e-petition 633591 gained is proof of that, along with the 31,000 that e-petition 6 Four, five, eight, eight, five has so far gathered. Now, in 2022, 2.76 million scientific procedures involving live animals was carried out in Great Britain in 2022. 55% of these were for experimental purposes, while creating and breeding genetically altered animals accounted for the other 45%. But a smidgen of good news is that between 2021-22, there was a 10% decrease in the number of procedures, which reached the lowest numbers since 2002, as my honourable friend just pointed out. Um, and while we did see 4,122 procedures used on dogs, it was a 2% decrease on 2021. The problem is there are still too many um, of these experiments taking place. Now, in a recent YouGov poll, nearly three-quarters of respondents were opposed to the testing of both ingredients and completed cosmetics on animals. This included 58% of people who strongly opposed to both types of testing, while some 47% of people think testing individual ingredients from medicines on animals is acceptable when there is no animal alternative. 30% think it is not acceptable. Now, I naturally, as somebody who's campaigned on these issues for a long time, falling to the majority view on animal testing 
when it comes to cosmetics. And actually, I'd like to thank my honourable friend for Red Ruth and Cameron for the work that he did on this um, as Secretary of State. However, when it comes to medicines, I tend to melt into a mess of complexity because sometimes personal experiences and those of our constituents can muddy a binary view on this issue. Now, I have absolutely no doubt that the success of my breast cancer treatment is down to experiments that have taken place in the past on animals. It is hard to remove that from the equation. And when I had an excellent meeting with Animal Free Research UK, I was keen to explain my quandary. But in the process of doing so, it was good to not only hear of the work being done in human-specific technologies at hubs like the University of Exeter, but it's also been useful to learn of the work that the Association of Medical Research Charities are doing to improve transparency around animal research and animal welfare. And it is worth noting that many of the AMRC's members make it very clear that they only support research involving animals where there is no alternative. Now, given cancer survival rates have doubled in the last 40 years, the scientific community ought to be thanked for its painstaking research and analysis. But we know that sometimes this involves studying the biology of a disease in a whole body, not just on individual cells or tissues. However, even those of us that are beneficiaries of that research want to know that good animal welfare practices have been employed and that its use has been clinically justifiable. But how long can we keep doing animal testing when technology and NARMS is advancing so quickly? Now, I would argue that if we, as a country, are to become a science superpower, then we should lead by example and rapidly accelerate the use of animal free research with a long-term ambition of zero animal experiments. We need the roadmap that my honourable friend outlined. However, bold action needs to start today if the UK is to keep pace with global action to support human-specific technologies. The US Congress has now passed the FDA Modernisation Act, facilitating the use of non-animal methods for drug testing, while the European Commission has committed developing a roadmap for ultimately phasing out animal tests. Now, animal Free Research UK and others have made some short and medium-term recommendations, which I think are reasonable asks. They note that the forthcoming budget could be an opportunity to launch an ambitious fun funding call to develop human-specific te technologies and attract private investment. They suggest providing dedicated transition grants to leverage the potential of human-specific tech and to provide tax relief for companies that are working on these innovations. They also suggest establishing a non-animal science innovation hub, which I'm sure would be really attractive to the next generation of scientists whose animal welfare and environment conscience seem so naturally embedded. And for what it's worth, I agree with the point that colleague, colleagues have made about ministerial responsibility and the challenges that brings. But I'm also pleased that we have a science minister who does care about these matters. Ending animal experiments can only lead to positive change into research methods. The government has introduced a great deal of animal sentience and animal welfare legislation in recent years, for which I and my constituents are truly grateful. However, to allow the continued use of animal testing only undermines the achievements of this legislation. And I hope that the House will join us, actually, today in upholding the government's commitment to animal welfare by supporting these excellent petitions and by looking forward as to how we can continue to reduce the use of animals in research so that one day it is not necessary at all. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I wish to thank the Honourable Member for Kershulton and Wallington for opening this debate so comprehensively, as I know he has done in other such debates in the past. And I'm delighted to participate in this debate today relating to animal testing and non-animal research methods arising from e-petitions, which between them attracted over 140,000 signatures calling for an end to use of animals for toxicity tests and the prioritisation of non-animal methods in research and a ban on the use of dogs for testing and research purposes. Now, the Honourable Lady for um, Chatham and Aylesford pointed out that she receives a lot of emails about animal 
animal welfare issues, and I'm sure that she's not alone in that. Certainly, I receive more emails about animal welfare than any other issue, which is quite remarkable when you consider the, the issues that we see on the news every day. But it shows the level of concern, commitment and affection that our constituents across the UK feel about animal welfare. And we have debated the principle of using animals in research many times before. And, Madam Chair, here we are again. It's frustrating, but those of us who believe testing on animals must end, we must keep debating it. And we must keep making the case until we see an end to these horrific and unnecessary practices. It's long been accepted, as we have heard, that animals are sentient beings. They have the ability to have physical and emotional experiences. And we know that overwhelmingly the public wishes to see an end to animal testing because it is cruel, causes suffering, and more importantly, it is unnecessary. Yet 2.7 million procedures involving animals took place across the UK in 2022. That number is very high, and experimental procedures are decreasing. But the reality is that even where alternative non-animal research methods are available, using animals for experiments is taking place. And I think of all the aspects of this that are distressing, that is perhaps the one that is most difficult for anybody to justify. We know there are animal tests taking place in the UK and Europe where there are accepted, validated alternatives. Over three quarters of adults living in Scotland, 76%, believe alternatives to animal tests should be a funding priority for the UK for science, in the UK for science and innovation. And a majority of Scots, 62%, want deadlines for phasing out animal tests. When it comes to specific species, more than two thirds of Scots think it is unacceptable to use dogs, cats and monkeys in such experiments. Undoubtedly, despite huge public opposition, the UK is one of the top users of primates and dogs in experiments in Europe. But it seems a culture change is needed and it's for that we must keep on pressing. According to People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, most of the drug testing on dogs sees them repeatedly force-fed or forced to inhale substances over prolonged periods to measure the effects of repeated exposure on their major organs. In some factory farms, female dogs are forced to spend their entire lives as puppy-producing machines allegedly churning out between 1,600 and 2,000 offspring for medical testing each year. The work of Camp Beagle, some of whom may be here today, a well-known campaigning group, has led calls on the UK government to ban toxicity pro testing of products like household bleach, cleaning products and wheel weed killer on beagles. And I'm sure we all welcome the fact that Canada, as has been mentioned by the Honourable Member for Cashelton and Wallington, Canada recently banned the use of animals for regula regulatory toxic toxicity tests, but we need to see the same here in the UK. The public is appalled to learn that in the name of animal testing, dogs are kept in overcrowded cages, forced to inhale toxins with funnels strapped to their snouts, undergoing immense pain and suffering until they die or are killed. Legally, they can be poisoned with toxic chemicals, shot, irradiated, gassed, blown up, stabbed, drowned, burned, starved, have their bones broken, limbs amputated, subject to electric shocks, deprived of sleep and infected with diseases. And yet, recent developments in evolutionary and developmental biology and genetics has significantly increased our understanding of why animals have no predictive value for human responses to drugs or the pathophysiology of human disease. Indeed, over 92% of drugs that show promise in animal tests fail to translate into safe and effective medicines for humans. Cruelty-Free International research shows that the UK is in the top 10 of animal testing countries in the world, as in the top 10 user of, of dogs and monkeys in experiments in the world. That, that's quite something. So in the face of such unnecessary cruelty and suffering, again, we must call for rigorous public scientific hearings to reduce this unnecessary harm caused by animal experiments and ban this immoral and unjustifiable practice and pursue alternatives instead. There is also a greater need 
for transparency in the animal research industry, as the Honourable Lady for Chatham and Aylesford indicated. And the member for Cashalton and Wallington talked about funding challenges um, for funding new approach methodologies. But it's also worth remembering that when the UK, as I, I, I assume it will, when the UK updates its legislation in this area, industry will adapt just as it will in Canada and others taking a leading approach. And one thing we know with confidence about scientists and researchers is that they are able to innovate. It is the very reason for their existence. It is long past time for the UK to update animal welfare legislation which reflects the ethical and humane rights of animals to improve animal welfare standards domestically, which so many of us want to see and it's also past time internationally to commit to working better, to be, to working better animal welfare standards on a global scale. New approach methodologies do not use animals, avoiding the inherent cruelty and the problem of animal-human species differences. New approach methodologies, me methodologies use advanced in vitro and in silico technologies to model diseases, test treatments and investigate biological processes in humans. This should be the scientific pro pro fo focus instead of the outdated, unreliable experiments on animals so often engaged in. The Animal Welfare Sentience Bill was important because it enshrined the sentient rights of animals, but it didn't go far enough. It didn't recognise the rights of sentient animals undergoing scientific testing and those in MOD military experiments. That is a glaring omission which must be corrected. And we in the SNP condemned this omission at the time and tabled two amendments during the third reading of the bill to correct this, but the government voted it down. The European Union is moving away from cruel experiments on animals and using cutting-edge replacements as evidenced by the European Parliament which voted in favour of developing an action plan to phase animals out of EU science and regulation. It's vital that the UK government supports a new regulatory environment that enables the transition to new approach methodologies. In 2020, 77 scientists and academics from Animal Research UK signed an open letter to the government and medical agencies calling for a clear timetable for regulatory change to enable the development of medicines without the use of animal testing, indicating that investment in human relevant science is a golden opportunity to revitalise medical research, save money, create wealth and improve public health. Leading scientists in the human-specific technologies wrote to the Chancellor last month to consider providing government support to help unlock the, future, the potential of future-focused technologies in the upcoming spring budget. Specifically, they are recommending tax relief for, relief for companies developing and using these cutting-edge technologies, a bold funding call to industry and academia, and transition grants to facilitate a shift away from animal use. So while it appears that the government is content to let the status quo continue, sentient animals continue to undergo horrific and unnecessary suffering, and our constituents continue to be horrified as they look on, helpless at a government that is simply not listening. Whole swathes of the respected scientific community and renowned academics also apparently feel they are not being listened to. It is past time that this unenlightened and unnecessary torturing, torturing and testing on our fellow creatures ended, and I hope the Minister will act without delay. I and many MPs have been and will continue to be a voice for the voiceless and a voice for common sense, and I hope the Minister's response today will show that he is ready to add his voice to this growing chorus, which also will benefit science and public health. Um, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dame Caroline, and it's a real pleasure to serve under your chairship. And um, it also, um, I want to acknowledge the, the strength of uh, the public's uh, feeling 
on the subject that these petitions uh, to get that we are debating today together received over 140,000 signatures, including 114 in Newcastle Central. And I'd like to thank everyone who, who signed these petitions for bringing these important issues to be debated in Parliament once again. I'm calling for an end to the use of dogs in testing and research in the UK and an end to the use of animals in toxicity testing and the prioritisation of non-animal methods are key issues. And I also want to congratulate the member for Carsholton and Wallington uh, for the expert way in which he introduced the debate and all those who have spoken on the, in this debate and intervened, as all uh, contributions, I feel, have been very well informed and thoughtful. So as the opposition spokesperson in this debate, I want to also emphasise and like, state clearly that the Labour Party believes that un the unnecessary suffering of defenceless animals is unequivocally wrong. The Labour Party was founded to support the rights of working people, and I believe strongly that human rights and animal rights are intrinsically linked. Those who are cruel or, or ignore the rights of animals often do the same for humans. So recognising and standing up for the rights of animals is an important part of Labour's record. From the Hunting Act in 2004, which banned the cruel practice of hunting with dogs, to the Animal Welfare Act of 2006, which put in place strong domestic protections for pets, livestock and wild animals, we have used the power of government to protect animals. We introduced the offence of unnecessary suffering, mutilation and animal fighting, and we banned the testing of cosmetic products on animals in 1998. The last Labour government has a record to be proud of and, if privileged enough to form the next government, we would build on that legacy. The British people expect nothing less because, as members have pointed out, um, the Brit we are a nation of animal lovers. Um, as the member for Bath said, the, the RSPCA was founded in 1824. That was actually six, 60 years before the founding of the NSPCC. Now, I don't think that reflects a hierarchy of concern, but it does reflect the uh, extent to which we are concerned about the welfare of animals. And no wonder, animals improve the welfare of humans in so many ways, ranging from providing companionship, improving mental health, and, and facilitating rescues during natural disasters. Animals serve as the best companions, offering emotional support and reducing feelings of loneliness. Domesticated animals can help people recover from severe illnesses and they help us in speech therapy, occupational therapy and further physical rehabilitation. Um, 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 I have, on Thursday, I visited St. Paul's uh, School in Elswick, Newcastle. I asked them what they wanted from Parliament. Top of the list, an end to food poverty and a support dog. Uh, animal welfare and love of animals is at the heart of British society and culture. Now, as the Shadow Minister for Science, Research and Innovation, my priority is to enable the best possible science in this country that will deliver the best possible outcomes for people across the UK and indeed the world and I believe for animals as well. Since the introduction of the Animals uh, Scientific Procedures Act in 1986, animal testing practices have improved. The three R's, which have already been mentioned, replacement with uh, reduction in refinement, remain worthy principles. But as the member for Camborne and Redworth emphasized, many are rightly distressed and concerned by the continuing scale and at times severity of animal testing. As has been said, in 2022, over 1.5 million experimental procedures involving animals were carried out. 4% of these were assessed as non-recovery, that is to say the animal died, and almost 4% again were classed as severe. But, Dame Caroline, there are real reasons to foresee a better future. We are in the midst of a scientific and technological revolution that is transforming the economy, society, and the conduct of science itself. 
Non-animal or new approach methods, NAMS, for scientific research are developing at great pace, enabled by advances in artificial intelligence and engineering biology. Now, it is true that there are currently limits to the eff efficacy of NAMS, but that is becoming less true with each passing year. And, has, and, has, and as has been pointed out during this debate, there are clearly limits to the efficacy of animal testing. Cell cultures, advanced modeling, and donor tissues are already helping to reduce the use of animals in testing. In cosmetics, we've seen great success in using NAMs to predict skin sensitization. A 2018 study found this was even better than the once standard mouse test. And one of the petitions we are debating today calls for an end to the use of dogs in testing. Dogs currently cannot be used in testing if any other species could be used. But nevertheless, in 2022, 4,122 dogs were experimented on. I thank the 31,350 people who signed the petition, including 18 of my constituents in Newcastle Central. The other petition being debated calls for an end to toxicity testing in favour of NAMS. And once again, I'd like to thank the 109,378 people, including 96 of my constituents who signed it. The two petitions naturally overlap. For example, beagles particularly are used for toxicity testing, being injected, fed poisonous chemicals and asphyxiated in their numbers. And it is impossible not to feel for these animals. At the same time, we must recognize that advocates for this type of testing will argue that it is necessary to save human lives, as the member for Chatham and Aylesford highlighted so powerfully. Understanding animal research, a membership body of research... I'll certainly give away, yes. Um, that I do not advocate or support any testing on dogs, um, right. particularly in the manner that she has pointed out. Um, my point was that, obviously, research has in the past taken place on animals that has enabled a great deal of, uh, um, of, of positive outcomes for cancer patients like myself. Um, yes, um, thank, I thank the member for uh, that, the honourable member for that intervention. Yes, no, I wasn't implying a support for a specific type of testing, but just a general point that animal testing in the past and, um, other, and as groups such as understanding animal research would argue, currently does, um, uh, um, co is considered necessary to save human lives by some. Um, um, understanding animal research also gives the, the um, example of Duchenne's muscular dy dystrophy, a lethal childhood disease, um, as one condition where canine models are effective. Now, so I believe um, um, that science and innovation can show the way out of this moral maze. For example, taking the example of testing on dogs, the NC3Rs, the UK's National Centre for Animal Replacements, has established a project to develop a virtual uh, second species, a virtual dog indeed, using historical data. Or considering toxicity testing, look at the way that the UK-based company XLR8 has developed Acutox-X. The Acutox-X test is a human alternative to the LD50, um, a test involving giving increases doses of toxic substances to groups of animals until 50% of them are killed. And just this month, Newcastle Biotech, um, a spin-out in my constituency um, from Newcastle University, raised uh, over two million um, from the Northeast Venture Fund uh, for its uh, models of the retina, kidney, and lung, which are used in drug development in reduced reliance of animal testing. Dr. Mike Nichols, their CEO, told me, and I think it's worth quoting this, over the last 10 years, invite in advances in stem cell biology, 3D bioprinting, and high contact analytical methods such as transcriptomics has revolutionized our ability to build laboratory mimics of human tissues that can reduce the use of animals in the early stages of drug discovery. Pioneered in academia, these approaches are now established in mainstream biotech, and importantly, the regulators have moved to increasingly accept these non-animal models as reliable. Innovations such as retinal organoids, 
produced by New Cells Biotech are being used globally to support the development of drugs that cure blindness, demonstrating the power of these new alternatives. And he goes on to say that while the prospect of fully replacing animal testing is likely to be at least a decade away, that prospect is no longer beyond the horizon and certainly significant reductions in animal testing will be driven through innovation and awareness within this timescale. Yes. I'm grateful to uh, give it away. And she made a very important point, which is while these technologies are developing year on year, they have been around for some time. Uh, she said for 10 years. Uh, some would say that some of these technologies have been around for closer to 20 years. So why does she think it is that we've not seen a uh, corresponding fall in the number mm. of animal tests to date? Uh, does she believe that the current project licensing regime is rigorous enough? Oh, um, the um, general um, member makes a very good point, and I'd like to thank him. For he, in his um, speech, he, did, he talked about some of the challenges around the existing regime, and I think that we, we, we've, we've, we have seen you know, a huge growth in science, you know, a huge growth in biotech and specifically, and that may have led to increases, unfortunately, in animal testing. But it is true also that the regulatory regime, as I will go on to talk about, needs to reflect uh, the advances in, te in technology. So, because, you know, as well as chips and organoids, we have techniques such as proto eco e Edonomux, single cell sequencing and access to human cell types we did not ha previously have. And for example, BitBio, a leading UK cell coding company, um, is able to manufacture human neurons, which previously were only available through brain surgery. So with these advances, um, Dame Caroline, I'm absolutely certain that our brilliant scientists and innovators can help provide workable models to animal testing. Given our country's strengths in AI and data science, Britain can be at the forefront of this uh, scientific revolution that will make animal testing a thing of the past. But I would like to ask the Minister whether he considers this a priority. Estimates show that NAMs receive as little as 0.2 to 0.6% of UK medical research funding. Being a first mover in this will bring with it jobs, investment, economic growth and better animal welfare. So will the Minister explain what the government is doing to support British scientists and what it is doing to incentivise scientists to proactively seek to use NAMs in British labs, creating a customer base to pull through new labs? Finally, before I entered Parliament, I worked uh, for the regulator Ofcom, so I know that regulation can drive innovation and open up competition, or it can be a barrier to it. Labour is proposing a regulatory innovation office to help ensure it's the former, not the latter. And we need to take a proactive approach to ensure that regulation reflects emerging methods of research to drive forward scientific discovery and trials while reducing uh, and uh, reducing uh, animal testing. With these new technologies, there's huge opportunity to create new drugs much faster and for less money. Today, it takes an average of 12 years and 1 billion US dollars to create a drug from initial filing with the, F uh, the FDA to FDA approval. These tools can provide significantly better possible targets for therapy, reducing time and therefore cost. So responsive proactive regulation will help improve the active take-up of new NAMs in accordance with the current regulations principles of replacement, therefore eliminating avoidable tests as soon as is practical. This would help ensure that the, that the public, that the government is moving in the right direction and doing this uh, proactively. At the same time, um, I, yeah, I, our pro-innovation approach will create opportunities for entrepreneurs and innovators to develop and bring to market new NAMs with stable business environment and a path to market. So our ambition is clear, and the views of the members today are well known. The opportunity is there to support NAM development, de drive replacement of animal testing, and support the welfare of all, animal hum and human and like. This will not happen overnight. Animal testing as in human health has long been embedded in our pharma sector. However, we will not advance human therapies and cures as we should if we continue to rely on animals that do not get the diseases humans suffer from. Thank you.
I call Minister Andrew Griffiths. Thank you, Dame Caroline, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I'd like to thank my honourable friend, the member for Carshalton and Wallington, for opening today's important debate. And since it's the first time I've spoken uh, since that, commend him for his personal bravery uh, when he spoke last week uh, at Prime Minister's uh, questions. The number of signatories to the petitions that I think almost all honourable members have uh, mentioned uh, indicates the strength of public feeling on this matter. Um, and understanding that this is not the first time it's been debated, though my first time, um, we all seek, I think, that this, whilst it doesn't become an annual event, uh, this is absolutely the right forum uh, and the right place in which these very important matters are debated. So I congratulate both all of those who've contributed, uh, but also everybody who has signed the petitions. I completely understand that the use of animals in science, including toxicity testing, is a sensitive issue. More than that, I personally believe uh, that we'd all share my view that the day can't come quickly enough when we're able to end the practice of animal testing. Until, or until indeed to actually hasten to bring that moment forward to us, the UK is, as honourable members have observed, one of the world's leading nations in the development of non-animal methods. And the government is keen to ensure that they are utilised wherever possible. And I heard from uh, colleagues, honourable members, um, some frustration or concern about the pace of adoption where those scientific methods exist. I think it's fair to say that most honourable members also accept, and I've met with uh, charities and organisations working in the sector, including animal free research, that we're not quite yet at that moment when we can fully replace animal testing. We, we are all to a degree in uh, what the member for Chatham and Aylesford talked eloquently uh, about that mess of complexity, uh, but it doesn't mean we're not clear about the direction of travel uh, and the goal which we seek over time. And as Science and Research Minister, I take my responsibility uh, within that trilogy or multiple departments of government that uh, my right honourable friend for Camborne and Red Ruth talked about, I take my responsibility within that uh, extremely seriously. The government is supporting and accelerating advances in biomedical science and technology to reduce reliance on the use of animals in research. And not all of that research, when you hear data points about the percentage of research money that is spent, not all of that is clearly labelled as non-animal research. Developments in artificial intelligence, in cell cultures, uh, in cell research, in uh, understanding the function of human organs, better imaging, uh, all of those can contribute uh, to the advance of non-animal methods that can be put to work in this space. And indeed, we heard that from the Honourable Member uh, for Newcastle about the very successful spin-out uh, from her university. And we're seeing that sort of development, as, again, as the Right Honourable uh, Friend for Camborne and Redra has talked about, this exponential rate of growth. Uh, and it is indeed a, uh, an amazing moment in science of all kinds uh, that we're seeing. Extraordinary advances uh, in non-invasive techniques such as medical imaging, sensing and ex vivo analysis that's revolutionising human healthcare. Through UKRI, through the UK Research and Innovation, the government is actively supporting and funding, and I'll have more to say on this later, the development and dissemination of the three R's. If you weren't familiar with the three R's when you came here today, we're probably all uh, more familiar now. That is the replacement of the use of animals where they're not necessary research. I think that's the aim that we all share. Reduction in the use of animals uh, in the meantime, and the latest figures I have uh, slightly more recently than the member for uh, Carl Shalton and Wallingford talked about show a 10% reduction in research. Um, now, we'll have to look through. I don't want to overweight any particular year's numbers, um, but we'll have to look through and see that continued reduction uh, that we all seek. But for 2022, the latest data I had was a 10% reduction. Um, so replacement, reduction and refinement to eliminate uh, or reduce distress uh, to those animals uh, that are involved. 
This is achieved primarily, but not exclusively, through the approximately £10 million of funding per year uh, that goes to the National Centre for the Three R's. And we heard uh, other examples, including, I think it was Queen Mary's, um, the Centre for Animal uh, Research, that's doing great work on that. We also heard, Madam Chairman, the use of animals in science lies at the intersection of two important public goals. The benefits to humans and animals, a lot of the research benefits animals uh, themselves, um, and the environment, as we seek to have the very highest standards of environmental protection. Uh, but also balancing that with the UK's proud commitment to the highest possible levels of animal welfare. And that's why, and we heard this from a number of uh, members today, the use of animals in testing is strictly limited to specific purposes, including assessing the safety of medicines or chemicals, protecting human health, and protecting the environment. A lot of research of compounds goes on to understand what their downstream effect on our rivers, lakes, oceans, and natural habitat would be. We also heard that the use of animals in scientific procedures is only permitted if there is no non-animal alternative available. And I'll try and address some of the remarks, specifically, I think, about the way in which that legal principle laid down by Parliament in legislation is, is applied in practice and, and whether uh, that is as effective as the Honourable Member would like, the right Honourable Member uh, would like. We know that despite, in general, the legal protection, some animal testing of chemicals is required under UK law to protect the environment, um, but testing is only permitted once it's established that no alternative exists and it's dependent upon the chemical and quantity that's manufactured. We are, as I said, world renowned for our leadership in this space uh, and we should continue to be alive and open to what other countries, the example of Canada uh, was mentioned, uh, some of the work that I've uh, done and some of the meetings have focused precisely on how we can ensure that the UK remains the best place in the world, both in terms of the legislative framework as well as the science, and that makes sure that non-animal technologies and the advances that are happening constantly are reflected in policy, practice, legislation in this place, and the regulations of animal research. Since it was originally established, the NC3Rs has invested in total almost £90 million in research uh, and £27 million in contracts through its Crack It Challenges Innovation Scheme for UK and EU-based institutions, with that funding mainly focused on approaches for safer assessment of pharmaceuticals. The UKRI Biotechnology and Biological Services Council, a, a different body, uh, supports research aimed at developing and applying innovative methods to study human and animal psychology, physiology, including in silico approaches organ on a chip, organoid, and other advanced cell culture systems. Now, Madam Chairman, despite this, despite that funding I've talked about, I believe that there can, more can be done. So ahead of today's debate, I asked UKRI that we double our investment in research to achieve the three R's and develop non-animal alternatives. And I can announce that from 10 million per annum this year, that investment will now reach £20 million across the system in fiscal 24-25. That's a doubling of the research given in this space. In addition, and I hope this is welcome uh, across the House, I can announce that this summer, work that has been going on uh, by my predecessors and across uh, other departments of government, the government will be publishing a plan to accelerate the development, validation and to uptake of technologies and methods to reduce the reliance of the use of animals in science. And I can see, and the minister, sorry, the, the former minister will recognise some of the impedance on a minister at the dispatch box, but I can see no reason why that plan could not at least consider some of the machinery of government changes that my right honourable friend for Camborne and Falmouth uh, talked about. Redruth, sorry, Redruth.
Everyone will welcome the <coughs> significant increase in funding that he's pledged today uh, to support uh, research on, on non-animal methods. But um, is his department curious at all as to why <coughs> the numbers of uh, animals used in experiments has not gone down, despite huge increases in technology in this area? And as part of a review of the, the current licensing process for projects, you know, would he consider trying to get us some analysis about whether it's an objective test as to whether or not to grant a license, or whether it's a subjective test based on something that some ethical committee claims? Uh, well, my right animal friend makes a very good set of points, uh, and it's something that we will look at further, um, and that I'm already in discussion about the efficacy of the licensing regime uh, with my, uh, my friend, the, the noble Lord Sharp, uh, on precisely this. He's the Home Office Minister uh, responsible. Can I ask the Minister, as he stands here today, how confident is he that the regulatory bodies um, who monitor these matters are sufficiently well versed in up-to-date replacement and reduction opportunities to prevent unnecessary testing. As he stands at the moment, does he have confidence in that system? Uh, well, my, my honourable friend asks a very detailed point, and she herself had made some uh, statements that I'd, I'd like to verify um, the efficacy of, efficacy of anyway. I was concerned to hear about dogs being... Uh, being shot or blown up, um, and I'd, I'd ask her if she's got evidence of that, please, to, um, to share that with me. That would be a subject, I think, of great concern um, and, and, and perhaps bring to life some points in the regulatory system that, that have not to date crossed my desk. So I'd, I'd take that matter very seriously, uh, but it's also important that these debates are led by the facts, um, and so I will let the facts decide uh, the efficacy of the regulatory system. On the point of the plan, uh, we will clearly produce that plan uh, together with uh, officials, but also involving the very widest uh, group of stakeholders. Um, in the coming weeks, uh, a cross-government group will convene to lead this work, and we'll be consulting uh, stakeholders across the industry, uh, academia, uh, medical research charities, uh, and those operating in this space uh, to produce that detailed plan and the commitment is to publish that this summer. I can also announce today, uh, Dame Caroline, given the uh, strong level of interest uh, and uh, the, the, the level of support for the petition, uh, but what members of Parliament uh, are regularly petitioned on, I can announce that we'll restart the Public Attitudes to Animal Research Survey. Uh, that was unfortunately delayed during the pandemic, uh, and it's important to me, and I'm sure to this House, uh, that these debates are informed by that. That was seen as a very useful tool uh, for those working in this space, uh, and I'm keen that that is restarted. The next survey will take place in the coming months, and the results of that survey will be published uh, this autumn, restarting that chronological series uh, about public, public attitudes in this space. We talked a bit about how um, animals in science is highly regulated, and I hear the concerns about um, the, that, that process. Understandably, in any regulatory process, different people will have different views about the efficacy. Of it, efficacy. Um, there is a three-tier system of licensing, both at the establishment, project, and individual level. And I, again, uh, thought that was a very thoughtful contribution, and perhaps I'd meet with uh, my right honourable friend, uh, to benefit from some of his insights into that. Um, it's important to say, because uh, he talked about the importance of having vets, uh, qualified vets in that process, there are qualified vets in that process, uh, and the Animals in Science Committee uh, oversees that and advises the Home Office on that. Um, however, there is, endemic in any regulatory or licensing regime, uh, and that's not to say that this is indeed the, 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 the case, but of course, endemic within that is the danger of incumbent thinking. And perhaps um, the, the honourable member, right honourable member, was talking about there not being enough challenge in the process. Um, one of the potential ways of putting more challenge into that process, um, nudging, if you like, uh, is 
something we are going to do, which is the Home Office will shortly be increasing the fees for those licences. The Right Honourable Friend talked about a levy. Uh, this is not that, uh, but it is nevertheless um, increasing the fees and therefore the burden and perhaps shifting a little bit some of the presumption uh, away from defaulting to testing uh, with animals. In addition, the Home Office will review the duration of licences. The current duration of licences is typically five years. We've observed the fast rate of change in technology, uh, and so the Home Office will be reviewing the duration of those licences uh, to see perhaps whether a shorter licence period would be more appropriate and, again, would put more challenge into the system uh, to mean that people are coming back more often to do that. So, by way of conclusion, uh, Madam Chairman, um, I do want to be clear, it is the position of the government that we want to replace the use of animals in scientific pre procedures with non-animal alternatives wherever we can. For now, the carefully regulated use of animals in scientific research remains necessary if we're to protect humans and the wider environment. That's why our current approach is to continue to support and fund the development and the dissemination and the adoption of techniques that replace, reduce and refine the use of animals in research and to ensure that the regulatory framework that we have is both robust in law and robust and rigorous in practice. I'd like to conclude by thanking members uh, once again for their insightful and thoughtful contributions to today's debate and I look forward to working together going forward. And don't worry, I don't intend to take the full hour and a half that's left of this debate <laughs> to wind up. Um, I would just like to thank again the petitioners um, for bringing this topic to the House for us to debate today and thank colleagues for their contributions to them. Um, if I could, Dame Caroline, just clarify the record on something that I said earlier when I spoke about the non-publication of data. Uh, I would just like to clarify that the publications I was talking about referred to detailed information on procedures by establishment type, i.e. whether this is a commercial venture or a academic one, which ceased being published in 2021. Uh, also, the annual publication of technical summaries for project licenses that were granted. Uh, I may have inadvertently suggested that they, we stopped publishing data on how many procedures took place. I just wanted to clarify that that was not the case. Uh, I'd like to thank again all of the organisations, the campaign groups, the charities and others, many of whom who are represented in the public gallery today, for briefing me and other colleagues in advance of, this, uh, of today's debate. I'd like to thank in particular my right honourable friend, the member for Camborne and Redruth, for, for his incredibly detailed and knowledgeable contribution. Uh, and also to thank my honourable, right honourable friend, the member for Chatham and Ellsford. Um, I particularly enjoyed her description of her melting in a mess of complexity. Uh, a great Tinder profile, if ever I've heard one. I'll certainly, <laughs> certainly be investing <laughs> in that. Uh, and I would like to thank the Minister as well for his response. So those of us who are regulars at petitions debates will know how frustrating it can be sometimes to come to a petitions debate, hear a response of why the status quo is going to continue. So it's very rare, actually, that we get to leave a petitions debate with some actual nuggets of things for the future. So the restarting of the public attitude survey, the doubling, doubling of investment next year, the Home Office review of licence duration and fees, uh, and, of course, that all-important plan. Um, excellent steps in the right direction, and I'm very grateful that the Minister was able to make some announcements here today, and I'm sure that the organisations uh, who are represented here today and briefed us um, will want to engage um, with DSIT in advance of that plan to be able to feed in, uh, and I'm very grateful for that announcement, because, of course, as I think we've all made clear throughout the course of our speeches, if we do not make any progress, I'm sure we will be back here next year talking about exactly the same thing because that is what the petitioners expect of us. Um, but on that note, Dame Caroline, I beg to move. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered e-petitions 633591 and 645885 relating to animal testing and non-animal research methods. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. <clears throat> I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order. The sitting stands adjourned.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.